want to make sure we finish up on time so you can get dressed up for the gala this evening if you're joining us, and I hope you are. Uh, again, just a reminder, if you haven't, uh, for the morning session uh, uh, and, of course, now for the afternoon session, fill out the evaluation forms. It's very helpful to us as we plan out uh, next year's meeting. So uh, we're going to uh, start off uh, the afternoon. Uh, the first session is on preventable cancer burden, current state, and next steps. And I'll turn to our first uh, chair to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Renato Martins from uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and the Fred Hodge. Thanks uh, once more for the invitation to be here. I was here for most of the morning. I came back from a wedding in Portland last night. Uh, and uh, it was really quite outstanding. And I'm sure that these uh, afternoon sessions are going to be as good. Um, I want to apologize for any name assassination, although I've been co uh, coached by uh, one of my colleagues, so hopefully I will do okay. If not, I'll blame you. I'm grading this. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> Dr. Prabhata Jha is... Um, an endowed professor at the University of Toronto in Canada. He got his um, um, MD from the University of Manitoba and then his PhD at Oxford University. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, the um, um, ways to improve uh, uh, tobacco control and really uh, reading his uh, uh, a bio here it could not be any more qualified to be talking about uh, this uh, uh, subject as he um, has had a tremendous impact in this area and has consulted for the World Bank and uh, the WHO as well. So I know I'm reaching you right after lunch so I'm going to start with my conclusions which are as follows. Uh, I'd like to show you evidence, contemporary evidence, around the remarkably long loss of life, about a decade of lost life among smokers that start early and don't quit. Show you the evidence about ridiculously effective cessation is particularly of quitting by age 40 and preferably earlier. I will comment on poverty, both in the United States, in Canada, and also um, the, the global scenario. And the key message, really the, the key takeaway, is that in the United States and around the world, the core prevention strategy for cancer, I believe, remains a really large increase in the federal excise uh, tax on tobacco. If uh, Joe Biden is happening to watch in the, the, uh, the streaming of this, the message that I would impart is that the very ambitious project, which I believe some of the people here are involved in, which is the Cancer Moonshot, I tried to identify often uh, quite innovative ways of advancing uh, progress in cancer. And they set out a goal, which is to double the rate of progress in cancer prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, and to try to do that in five years, what has otherwise taken a decade. And I hope I'll show you some evidence that uh, the single most effective strategy to do so would be to triple the U.S. federal excise tax, currently about a dollar, to three dollars, or ideally five dollars, and that might well double the rate of decline of cancer mortality in middle age. Well, cancer prevention, of course, is broader than just tobacco, and you will hear from my uh, close friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Shankar, on uh, infections, particularly human uh, papillomavirus, and, but it does involve other types of uh, chronic disease or chronic infection control, um, involves thinking about dietary exposures, particularly aflatoxin, cold smoke, radiation. But tobacco it remains the most important cause of cancer, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, around the world. It's about a third of all U.S. cancer deaths are still due to smoking, and about 25% of all the premature deaths in the US. Because cancer kills, because smoking doesn't just kill from cancer, it kills from other diseases. So these are Richard Pito's estimates. Um, in 2010, about 484,000 deaths, 
And importantly, a large proportion of those are in middle age where many years of life are lost, about 23 years of life versus those in old age. Um, and lung cancer remains the dominant type of cancer that is due to, uh, due to tobacco. The evidence has to be taken in the context of what have been the trends over roughly the last 40 or 50 years. And there, there is re remarkable progress. In the United States, the overall probability of dropping dead in middle age, which is um, in this talk about 30 to 69, it, my definition of middle age changes as I grow older, but <laughs> mostly I'm gonna stick to 30 to 69 or 35 to 69. And here you see for a man in 1970, they had um, about a 43% chance of dropping dead in middle age, of which tobacco was well, close to uh, a third. And that's now down to uh, about 24%, and tobacco has fallen even faster than have overall mortality. Uh, so tobacco improvements have in fact pulled the overall improvement in survival in middle age overall. And I'll show you some important subsets that, that are different. Reassuringly, the non-smoker lung cancer rates between at least two major studies, these are the American Cancer Study prospective studies, or American Cancer Society's prospective studies, have not changed much. There is a concern, are lung cancer rates in non-smokers actually rising? Well, there is a shift in the type of lung cancer uh, detected, but uh, very little change, at least in this 20-year uh, period, in non-smoking lung cancer rates, either in men or women. So what are the three big messages for the individual smoker? And now we can say this applies um, very much worldwide. The first is the risk is big. At least half, perhaps closer to two-thirds, of typical smokers that start early and don't quit will be killed from either cancer, vascular disease, or respiratory disease, or in the case of India, from tuberculosis. A quarter of those occur in middle age and losing many years of life, and that stopping is very effective. And I'd like to quickly contrast the risks of smoking uh, against other big exposures that are also important, uh, but have very different profiles. So I'll start with a comparison with alcohol. And the message for alcohol is actually quite simple. Don't drink like a Russian male. <laughs> if you see the patterns in um, Russia and the remarkable fluctuations in female mortality, let's say at ages 15 to 54, you really shouldn't have deaths at those ages. And contrast that fluctuation to the remarkable steady decline in the UK, which by no means is a teetotaler population. The remarkable fluctuations were very much due to changes in alcohol exposure. And you see this most dramatically for men. So what happened? Well, early on around 1986, President Gorbachev came in. He didn't like to see all the drunkards. Uh, so he imposed some restrictions on, on alcohol and death rates overall fell. Then Boris Yeltsin came in and you, all of you remember what a famous drunkard Boris Yeltsin was. He used to sell Yeltsin vodka in Red Square in little cachets which were cheaper than water. And there was a big increase in uh, the overall death rates. When the ruble collapsed, there was another big increase. So this remarkable fluctuation puzzled epidemiologists for quite a while because a lot of the excess was actually from what was described as ischemic heart de disease deaths. And the evidence otherwise suggested, well, it shouldn't have that effect. But this was nicely sorted out by David Zaridze and others who surveyed uh, in Siberia about 100,000 men that had died. And if you want the truth about drinking weight in Russia, then wait until a man dies and ask his wife. That's what they did. And what they compared were men who drank a bottle of vodka a day versus the control population, which were a bottle of vodka a week. So the control group is 20 shots a week. They didn't con find any non-drinking controls. <laughs> so, and you see there's a big excess in all medical causes, uh, certainly the relative excess is greater for, uh, for accidents, but all medical causes, including uh, particularly ischemic heart disease. Now, cancer wasn't affected, but it does make the point that only with very extreme patterns uh, 
of binge alcohol drinking, do you get any risks that compar are comparable to what you get for typical smoking? Okay, what about obesity? Again, often considered the next tobacco. Well, the loss of life from a typical smoker, as I'll show you, is about a decade of life. And that's now well established. Um, what would it take to have the similar loss of life? Well, effectively, it needs a population to have quite high levels of obesity. So uh, a BMI around 43 would equate to about a decade of lost, lost life. So in my case, my BMI is exactly at 24.5. And if I gained um, 100 pounds, then I would gain and kept that on, then I would have this typical loss of life as being a, of, of a smoker. Now with more modest levels of obesity, you, get, you do get a loss of life, but nothing comparable to what you get for typical smoking. What about something more esoteric like happiness? Well, Valerie Burrell studied women who reported themselves as being happy most of the time, usually, and sometimes never, and just followed them up 10 years once you take into account baseline uh, chronic disease. And there was no relationship with being happy, but there was a strong relationship with usual cigarette consumption. So the best thing to do is to basically be an unhappy non-smoker. <laughs> I used to be happy once. Um, <laughs> now remarkably, we, we've had 40,000 epidemiological studies of smoking, but only in 2012, when many of us gathered to honor Richard Dahl's birth centenary uh, on October 28, 2012, we met in Oxford and we traded notes as to what are the contemporary hazards of smoking. And there was a remarkable consistency of now showing a decade of life lost. So the, this slide shows the results from Richard Dahl's last study, Valerie Burrell's Million Women Studies, these are our US prospective data, Japanese atomic bomb survivors, and surprisingly, Indian men that smoke cigarettes also lost a decade of life. And this is how Brian Williams from NBC summarized our results. Smoking Oops. front from the New England Journal of Medicine, they state flat out smokers lose at least one decade of life expectancy over non-smokers on average. The encouraging news here is quitting before 40 reduces the smoking-related death risk by 90% compared to continuing on as a smoker. So that 22 seconds pretty much summarizes my career. <laughs> so the, the hazards of smoking in women are particularly relevant because they help track what happens to populations that have had more recent exposure. And what you see now in the U.S., is women who smoke like men die like men. The overall hazards, meaning about a triple of the risk in middle age, here defined as 25 to 79, with notable comparability in terms of lung cancer risks. But other things, which originally had thought not to be as affecting women, now affect them as well. Now, why is this? Well, it's simply because the women that have been studied now are the ones that have been smoking. Oops, let me go back. You got the right curve here? The mortality risk over time? Okay. Um, the women that have been smoking now and are studied only in this uh, century were the ones that started smoking really after World War II, born around World War II, took up smoking in the 60s and either stayed smokers for a long time or some of them quit. And here you see now the lung cancer, smoker non smoker lung cancer risks in women have become as steep as they were documented in earlier cohorts in men. And this is important because the early findings, as early as the 1950s or late 1950s, showed a big excess for men but not for women. And the tobacco industry used this to argue against smoking as a cause of disease. So what does this mean? Well, it's a very simple proposition. You can't live forever, but living till, let's say, age 80 in good health is a reasonable proposition for the public. And here you see for a woman in the United States who's 25, the probability of living till age 80 is remarkably different between never smokers and smokers. About a decade of lost life. 
and you know there's roughly um, a 70 percent chance of reaching old age if you're a never smoker versus well below a 40 percent if you're a typical smoker and the risk appears early it's not that it's all in old age even by age 40 you have a significant difference in um, or 50 you have a significant difference in the risk and this of course is adjusted for the differences that occur between smokers and non-smokers in education or alcohol use an important statistic however is that um, five percent of the world only is in the u.s and the major challenge is to think about where is the tobacco epidemic heading globally and that framework that I showed you for women also helps us understand what is going to be the evolution of tobacco hazards in, uh, in other populations. So China and India already have about a million smoking deaths. So worldwide is about five to six million. But it will rise on current patterns to something like 10 million. And a key way to think about this, which um, you should remember, is every ton of tobacco that's produced means about a million cigarettes, which means about one death. And then you can actually track global tobacco sales and get some sense of what will be the future predicted deaths. So in the case of China, the Chinese increase in cigarettes in men, Chinese women are sensible, Chinese men less so, um, has been 40 years after the comparable increase that occurred in the US. So in the US, per adults, it went 1, 4, 10, between 19, 10, 30, and 50. And 40 years later, in Chinese men, it went very similar. So what does this mean? Well, it means the Chinese smoking hazards will be very comparable to the peak of the US hazards. And that's already been shown in Zhen Ming's study, uh, Zhen Ming Chen's study, that in the contemporary time period, 25% of urban male deaths are due to smoking, 15% in rural areas. Just look across the water in Hong Kong, who started smoking seriously 20 years earlier, and that's already reached a third. So it's safe to say by 2030, about a third of all deaths in Chinese men in middle age will be due to smoking on current patterns. Now, India is a bit different because the smoking patterns are different. The, most of the, or about half now, of the smoked tobacco is small, locally manufactured beaties. And men who smoke BDs lose six years of life. There are a few women that smoke BDs, and they lose eight years of life. But men who smoke the Western cigarette lose a full decade of life. And because there's a transition from BD to cigarette, we think there's also uh, the explanation for why the relative risks are increasing. So this is from our million death study in India, showing that over time, in the black um, squares or black diamonds, the relative risks are becoming more extreme over time. Even though smoking prevalence is coming down, the risks are becoming more extreme. Um, my friend Shankar will, I'm sure, mention the importance of um, tobacco chewing also as a risk factor, which is unique to South Asia, and it's unique in terms of particularly oral cancer risks. And somewhat puzzling is that the risks in women who chew are much more extreme than men who chew for uh, mortality and also for uh, non-fatal uh, disease. Okay, well, the good news is that because the hazards of smoking are so big, the benefits of quitting are also very large and also very quick. So those smokers that quit typically by age, let's say 30, get back almost all of the 10 years of lost life. Quit by 40, get back nine, even quitting by 60 gets back four years of life. And in, this has been shown consistently in our studies and also in the Million Women study that if you look at the reductions in all-cause mortality, it's substantial. And even in lung cancer, there's a substantial reduction. So of course, women that smoke uh, and quit by 40 still have a higher risk, about threefold higher risk of uh, developing lung cancer or dying from lung cancer. But that has to be compared against something like a 25-fold higher risk if they continue to smoke. So cessation is very effective, even for lung cancer. This turns to the question, of course, what works? Well, we summarized the evidence on tobacco control some years ago uh, for the World Bank, and the key is prices are the most effective. The US has slowly realized this, and over time, prices have increased uh, 
Um, but interestingly, it took about the U.S. 30 years to really get a significant uh, price increase. Now, this is noted, and it is effective. For example, whenever there's a price hike, the calls to the monthly quit lines go up. So we do think prices are contributing to cessation. But an example of much more rapid progress from much faster and quicker tax hikes is surprisingly in France. You don't think of France as kind of an icon of tobacco control, uh, given the stereotypes. But France has done actually remarkably well. The prices tripled from about 1992 um, because the government announced taxes would go up every year 5% above inflation. And there was a significant increase in price and sales halved. So they were able to have consumption from about six cigarettes per adult per day down to three in just 15 years. In the US and Canada, we were able to have cigarette consumption from 11 cigarettes per adult per day down to five, but it took us about 35 years. So they've been much faster. And the impact of this has also been measured in the reductions in lung cancer at younger ages. So prior to 1997, about five years after that big tax hike started to take place, the French were showing increasing lung cancer rates in men and an increasing uh, trend in women, again reflecting that they started smoking older or later than did the men in the UK who had already started to quit. So you see quite opposite trends occurring just across the English Channel. Well, but after 1997, look at the remarkable decrease that occurred in France. The epidemic that was going up substantially reduced the female, ep and men, the female epidemic was effectively aborted. What are the objections to tobacco control? Well, there's a few, but one of the most important ones that's raised is that, well, you're going to hurt the poor if you raise taxes, and I want to spend a bit of time on that argument. First, about half of the difference in U.S. survival in middle-aged men is due between highly educated and less educated uh, men is due to differences in tobacco trivial mortality. So about 40% of those with low education, less than high school, of the deaths are due to smoking, but only about 20% in the highest education group. So if you remove the effects of tobacco, just imagine this without the gray bars, you would have actually much lower inequalities within the US. Now in Canada or in Ontario, we've been able to actually document this over a 20 year period. And what we looked at is the poorest fifth of men and the richest fifth of men. And of course, you see there's differences in the overall probability of, um, of death. And there's a bigger improvement of 7% in absolute terms for the richest men versus 5% in the poorest men. But of that improvement, smoking declines were 60% of those in the poorest men, but only about 30% in the richest men. So smoking uh, declines have actually reduced absolute inequalities. You can also see this by a comparison of Ontario versus U.S. Uh, non-Hispanic white men, same time period. And there you see that in both countries, the reductions in tobacco attributable mortality as a percentage were comparable, you know, about a third or a little over a third. In Ontario, we were able to reduce non-tobacco attributable mortality by 18%. In the U.S., less progress, about 5%. Now, that's been well described as the stagnation in, in uh, middle age, uh, particularly white, lower income mortality, uh, it might well have to do with the type of healthcare system that's delivered, which is a topic for the next session. The other concern that is often raised is, well, what about the financial burden of higher taxes? Because the poor are more responsive to higher prices, in fact, they quit more than the rich. And if you take that into account, this is a simple modeling study that we've done that says, well, if you raise in the United States prices of cigarettes by 50%, who would benefit? Well, the lowest socioeconomic group would gain about a third of the deaths averted, but in fact, of the extra taxes, they'd only pay 12%. And when we do this globally, we find very similar results in 13 low and middle income countries that basically there's a five-fold difference in the amount of benefit in the lowest income group versus the richest, 
And this also involves the same mechanism which is of concern here, that in low-income countries, people without access to health care get impoverished from tobacco attributable diseases. You reduce tobacco consumption and it actually increases income. So what we've estimated is a worldwide 50% higher cigarette price would mean something like 20 million fewer global poor. That's the World Bank definition. And by comparison, everything else we do in development per year lifts 30 million people out of poverty worldwide. So you can get a one-time big improvement in poverty simply from people not uh, dropping dead or becoming impoverished because of tobacco trial diseases with a big practicable tax hike. Okay, I've talked mostly about taxes, but there are other effective interventions. Plain packaging is one that's worked very well in Australia, and this basically restricts advertising except for the brand name here. In Canada, we were pioneers in using warning labels, and there's some evidence that this is effective. There is a study that if if you hand a pack of this to a man, the fellow will say, no, give me the one that says that it, it'll kill me. I prefer that versus this label. So they are noticing it. Lastly, lots of attention has been paid recently on um, what's happening with electronic cigarettes, or as Ken Warner phrases, this alternative nicotine delivery systems. And the evidence isn't clear yet, but so far, we know a few things. First the ANS products have considerably lower mortality risk than conventional cigarettes. That's well established. There's insufficient evidence, but uh, certainly no evidence clearly that e-cigarettes lead to increased uptake of cigarette smoking by youth. Lots of noise, lots of concern in the media, but the careful studies suggest there's not really a clear concern about the pathways. Now, that unfortunately, the attention on youth has distracted from the main focus, which I believe should be on, can e-cigarettes help current smokers to quit? And certainly one randomized trial in the New England Journal found that it actually achieved better um, cessation um, over about a year than did more established use of nicotine drugs. And there's some suggestion that access to this, these drugs uh, or access to electronic cigarettes might have accelerated the decline in youth uptake of cigarette smoking, but only in the US, not in the UK or in Canada, and might have raised cessation levels in the US and the UK. And this is a comparison of the toxin levels in electronic cigarettes versus cigarettes, and most of the known toxins that IARC has identified as being carcinogenic are hugely different between cigarettes and non-cigarettes, uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So let me conclude by making the point that prolonged smokers now can expect to lose a decade of life unless they quit, and quitting is effective, particularly early. I hope I've convinced you that tobacco control has an important role in reducing poverty, and the message you will give to your political leaders, in which I um, proselytize around the world, is a tripling of the federal tobacco excise tax is the top cancer prevention strategy. Um, our website has all of our information, and I would look, encourage you, if you're interested in the global evidence, to look at this volume, uh, which is set up uh, by the Disease Control Priorities um, work. DCP3 is the website, funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, ben Anderson, uh, Shankar, and I, and others collaborated on producing this volume, which is, uh, discusses global tobacco control. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhat, for a very entertaining talk. I think thanks to your talk, uh, Bine is uh, probably going to remove the Russian vodka from the gala drinks menu tonight. <laughs> uh, so well, our next speaker is Dr. Renga Swami Shankaranarayanan. And if you run into him at the uh, break, uh, you don't have to address him by his full name. I think he will introduce uh, himself to you by Shankar. Um, he, easily, I think, wins the prize for making the most effort to get to this conference. He traveled from India, arrived here late yesterday, and he'll be flying back uh, tomorrow. Uh, so thank you, Shankar, for uh, uh, putting in all that effort. He is a um, um, very um, renowned as an expert in cancer prevention and early detection. 
He hails from a small state in India called Kerala, which is on the southern tip of India, and also has the distinction of having the highest literacy rate in women. Um, and uh, the topic that he's going to talk about today is HPV-associated cancer. Um, and uh, Shankar has also uh, been working with WHO and many governments uh, all across the world in trying to advance his mission. So please uh, jo join me in welcoming uh, Shankar. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind uh, introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Binaisha and the organizers for the kind invitation and hospitality, and I would also like to thank Jesse for the travel arrangements and the administrative assistance. What I would like to do in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is to briefly describe, you know, that we can eliminate most of the HPV-associated cancers, and we are in the midst of exciting times. And I'm again glad to be here in Seattle because what we know and what we can apply uh, for cervix cancer control over the last few years has been heavily supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is headquartered here. I think uh, their funding support for a number of studies in Asia, Latin America, and, and uh, Africa helped evolve some of the most pragmatic policies that we can implement in uh, real health services in real settings, healthcare settings. <clears throat> you know, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is the cancer research uh, wing of the WHO, estimates cancer burden on a continuing basis. And you can access this information in Globocan. You go to Google and put Globocan. You can get into the Cancer Mondial, the global, can, the global Cancer Observatory, and you can get all the details on the global burden of disease. You know, we estimate that there has been around 18 million new cases for the year 2018. This is the most latest global can estimates. And uh, the HPV-associated cancers, which include cervix cancer, penile cancers, vulva, vagina, and a proportion of anal and oropharyngeal cancers all together account for around 663,000 cases, which is around 4% of all cancers. Out of which the major burden is caused by cervix cancer. The latest estimates for 2018 is around 570,000 cases and about 300,000, 370,000 deaths. So cervix cancer accounts for around 86% of all HPV-related uh, uh, cancers, and other cancers constitute around 93,000 cases. And if you look into, you know, there is a, some type of a correlation between the global burden of disease, I mean, the patterns of HPV-associated cancer and HPV prevalence in the different parts of the world. And if you see here, the global prevalence is around 11 to 12% of women. This is at any given point in time. And as the previous speakers uh, pointed out, HPV is an ubiquitous infection, that if you follow systematically uh, people born today over time, every day you will find almost everyone infected at some point in time, but in most people it disappears. So in only in few people it persists, and a clinical marker for a persistent HPV infection is any infection which is present in, in, in women above the age of 30 years is probably a persistent infection. So Sub-Saharan Africa, which has the highest burden of uh, HPV-related cancers, the prevalence is around 24%. If you go to places like Guinea, Conakry, it is around 40, 45%, the high-risk HPV prevalence. In Eastern Europe, 21%, Latin America, South Asia, and East Asia, whereas Europe and uh, the United States, North America, and that region is around anywhere between 8 to 12%. And um, the, the, the population attributable fraction of HPV in, uh, uh, infected cancers, uh, cancers related to HPV uh, infection, uh, varies from region to region. And if you see here in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is quite high. 15% of 15%, that is a population attributable fraction in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, places like Eastern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa have a high burden of infection-associated cancers. Uh, 
And if you take uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, hepatitis B, Helicobacter pylori, uh, human papillomavirus, they're all prevalent. Almost 25 to 30 percent of cancers are infection, chronic infection-associated cancers. And this is again from Globocan. And if you see here, it shows the, the, the incidence rates measured by population-based cancer registries in different parts of the world. And you can see almost there is something like a 15-fold difference in cervical cancer incidence rates. And what is interesting to see here is that if you go to regions like uh, the, the Middle Eastern Crescent, um, you know, all these Maghrebian countries and the Middle Eastern countries, Arab countries, you have a very low incidence of cervix cancer, which is less than four per 100,000. At the moment, WHO, uh, the threshold for cervical cancer elimination by WHO is four per 100,000. So that means these countries have already eliminated cervical cancer, and one of the most important um, protective factors there has been the high prevalence of um, uh, circumcision by men. But very high incidence rates are seen in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, in Zimbabwe and places like that, it is around between 40 and 50 per 100,000. This has been already shown here. This is a south-south disease. Cervix cancer is a south-south disease, poor populations. And among, within the population sections, it is a disease of poor women and poor people. And if you see some of the latest trends, there has been a declining trend in the Indian subcontinent. It is declining in different regions of India at a rate of 1 to 2 percent per annum. This is necessarily a good news. And this particular uh, phenomena has been used by some of the anti-vaccine lobbies, uh, saying that, oh, there's no need to introduce vaccination because the rates are declining. But the thing is, the rates decline, but beyond a certain level, the rates don't decline. And if you see the Bombay uh, registry data, it is plateauing over the last uh, 10 to 15, 15 years. And this is necessarily a good news because when something is declining, you have very specific interventions available. If you implement them, you can increase the rapidity with which the decline happens. And if you see, there are two regions in the world where there has been increase in cervical cancer incidence. This is Eastern Europe, Central Asia, you know, with the collapse of the health services and collapse of the screening programs there after the collapse of the Soviet Union and um, the socioeconomic uh, conditions which uh, started evolving after that, that has led to increase in cervical cancer incidence rates. The other region is Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, with the, especially with the emerging HIV epidemic. And if you see here, the, the, the increase in um, uh, the Eastern European countries is predominantly in the cohort which were born in, in recent years. And this is uh, Europe, and Europe has probably the most organized of all screening programs in the world. In fact, people say, I mean, screening programs are a mix of organized and non unorganized programs, but the proportion of people who come under organized programs in Europe and there are 28 countries with, uh, with uh, population-based screening programs in the European region, and, and some of them are very well organized, and most of the decline here is essentially related to the efficiency of the, of the cervical cancer screening programs in those countries. Then Singapore, it is very interesting to see Singapore. Singapore, when it uh, got independence from Britain in 1963, it is one of the, one of the developing countries with absolute poverty and, and all the things that you see in many of the countries like Laos and Cambodia prevailed in Singapore. There has been rapid economic progress in Singapore. And the cervical cancer incidence rates, and in fact, if you see, there are three ethnicities in Singapore, the Malays, the Chinese, and the Indians. So when Singapore got independence, the, the cervical cancer incidence rate in the Indians uh, is exactly like in Chennai. Most of them are from southern India. It is like 30 per 100,000. Singapore has a population-based screening program, of course unorganized, but the cumulative coverage of the target population over the last 10 years exceeds 80-85%. And you see the rapid decline in incidence rates. And there is decline in incidence rates in the Chinese population, but it is much more limited in the Malay population, 
which is uh, very, very different in uh, accessing healthcare. Then in China as well, you know, in fact, in China, uh, between 1950s and 1990s, there has been substantial decline in cervical cancer incidence rates. And if you see here, this is Shanghai. And it declined to almost like three per 100,000 in the period 1993 to 1997. But after that, it has started increasing. So in fact, you know, there is no guarantee in places where HPV infection rates are falling and cervical cancer incidence rates are falling. This cannot be the guarantee uh, that in future also it will be the same. The rates can increase. And in fact, in China, uh, during the 1990s, the population-based prevalence of high-risk HPV infection was anywhere, uh, between 2 to 5% in different regions. Now it is 20%. And if you see here the Shanghai data, you can see the age-specific incidence rates um, in 1988 and 2012. Actually, you can see several fold increase in corresponding age specific incidence rates in the later period. This is in, 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 in about 30 years. So you can see uh, the, the rates uh, going up. So this can happen. This is happening in different parts of uh, China at the moment. So, I mean, these complex patterns and the declining rates in different parts of the world are very conducive, and we have definite interventions which are available now. In addition to that, there is a complex social vaccination pattern, you know, which is related to circumcision, which is related to reduced parity. Reduced pa parity is also, multi-parity is also a very important risk factor, and some of the declines that you see in Asian countries, particularly in India, is due to reduced parity. And HPV vaccination is a very specific primary prevention intervention. Screening is time-tested. And there are alternative screening methods available which can be implemented in different health services. So cervical cancer elimination has been now one of the, one of the major topics uh, in, the, in the realm of non-communicable disease control. And, and WHO has essentially called for cervical cancer elimination. There is a timeline which has been taken into account, and cervical cancer prevention is one of the best buys. And in fact, WHO has defined, as already mentioned, uh, less than four per 100,000, that is the, the threshold for elimination of disease. Of course, eventually we will be aiming for something like zero incidence of disease, but the interventions have to continue, which is essentially elimination. And in fact, this is a great paradigm shift. So in fact, the roadmap for achieving cervical cancer elimination, you know, if, if, if a country achieves by 2030, these targets like 90% of the primary uh, targeted girls, that is between nine and 14 years are vaccinated. 70% of the target women between the ages of 35 and, and 45 are uh, screened, particularly if possible with the HPV test, which is a most accurate reproducible test. And there is another important thing which was always forgotten, because there are people who will, who will escape these interventions, both vaccination and screening. And in them, invasive cancer is a reality. And early invasive cancers are amenable to treatment. The cure rates following early invasive cancer management is quite high. They can be managed with single modality managements like surgery and uh, radiotherapy. So this is also an important philosophy in reducing mortality. Elimination doesn't mean incidence alone. Elimination also means uh, uh, you know, preventing deaths uh, from people suffering from invasive cancer. So early detection, early diagnosis, and treatment is also an important component of this philosophy. And a major advance which has happened in the recent years, which have made implementation of HPV vaccination in, in population-based programs more amenable is the, is the recent uh, uh, change in uh, the dose schedules uh, for the primary target age group of 9 to 14 years from three doses to two doses. So this has made, um, you know, this is making again implementation more feasible and then this becoming a GAVI eligible vaccine is also helping the introduction of the vaccine in different places. And there is more good news in, um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case of HP vaccination. There is 
consistent evidence emerging at the moment from observational studies that even a single dose of HPV vaccine is immunogenic, even though the, the quantum of antibodies generated by a single dose is lower than two doses or three doses. If you see here, this is from an Indian study. These are one and two doses, the HPV antibodies generated by one, uh, two and three doses. They are exactly superimposing. And this is uh, by a single dose. This is, um, this is immunogenic, but it is lower than that of um, two doses and three doses. But we yet do not know what is the threshold of antibodies, and there is no need for antibodies to be circulating. If you understand the vaccinology principles, it is, the, it is vaccine memory which is much more important than the quantum of circulating antibodies in the, in the, in the, in the blood. And then the second level of evidence, if you look into the persistent infections, you know, um, in, a, in a recent consultation, both the US NCA and IARC agreed for future vaccine trials, one can use persistent infection as the endpoint for licensing rather than waiting for CAN3 endpoint, a disease endpoint. So if you look into the persistent infection rates following a single dose, two dose, three dose, this is an Indian study again. Um, you know, it is exactly similar, showing that a single dose could be as effective as two doses and three doses, particularly in the primary target age group of, um, um, uh, you know, nine to 14 years. <clears throat> Actually, there are some interesting developments. A Chinese vaccine has already completed phase three trials. And the Chinese regulator has insisted on a CAN3 endpoint, and the CAN3 endpoint has been achieved. And this is waiting to be licensed in China. There is an Indian vaccine which has already undergone phase one and phase two trials, and phase three trials are, will come in soon. And the Indians, Indian drug regulator has agreed that immunoequivalence with that of Gadasil, the control arm in this trial is, um, is the, the quadrivalent vaccine Gadasil. So non-inferiority of immunogenicity is the primary endpoint for licensing. So we anticipate this vaccine uh, is likely to be licensed if it proves effective by 2021. And this is by the Serum Institute of India who manufactures almost 60% of the global vaccines which are used in the global AP program. So this is a very interesting development which will further increase the possibility of introducing HP vaccination. Then coming to screening, you know, pap smear is time tested. As Jose Geronimo said this morning, it is, it's effective, but it is quite challenging. But on the other hand, this is a simple cousin of uh, a pap smear, which is visual inspection with acetic acid. This has been the main test which has made possible introduction of screening initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because this is real time, the consumable is readily available, and workers can be trained, and this makes uh, treatment in the same visit possible. Treatment and diagnosis, provided you have triaging facilities. If triaging facilities are not there in the same setting, they can be treated. So this is one test which has made possible to introduce screening initiatives in impoverized health services. And this can form the basis to develop the necessary infrastructure at some point in time when the countries have the capability to introduce uh, HPV testing, you know, which is still suffers from, uh, you know, the testing, HPV testing is still complex because to get the consumables into the country and the costs involved and the supply chain, these are all practical, real practical challenges, even though HPV testing is very promising. We need to have a test which can be easily um, uh, you know, sort of entrenched in the health services, which does, doesn't suffer from a complex supply chain uh, management. <clears throat> and if you see here, I mean, as I said, in Sub-Saharan Africa, this has, been, this has been the main workhorse. And in countries like Laos, Cambodia, and places like the Philippines. This is just to show how, you know, in a country like Zambia, in 2006, when the, the initial evidence for the VAA started coming from India, Africa, and other places, that it is as accurate as pap smear in that setting. And this can also lead to reduction in incidence, because this, is, this was shown in an Indian trial. 
coordinated by IARC and then um, an Indian uh, uh, institution. Zambia introduced VAI screening. This was one province in 2006. And then in 2014, they, they faced, they, they, they increased the number of provinces where services are available. 2016, more provinces. And by 2018, the entire country has been covered. And in fact, half of the population is infected with HIV. The lesions are huge. The Zambians built up not only a VIA testing services across the country, they introduced cryotherapy services, and for managing large lesions, they introduced loop electrosurgical excision procedure. And since it will generate quite a lot of invasive cancers, they were able to organize a cancer center in Lusaka where the cases can be referred. So there was a plan which was put into place. And this was possible mainly because of the affordability of VIA to be introduced into the health services. At the moment, they found that maintaining cryotherapy services, because that will require gas, and again a supply chain issue, they have switched over to thermocoagulation. You know, in, a, in about three years back, IARC donated a thermocoagulator to the Zambians, and it was introduced in Lusaka. In one year, they treated around 2,000 women. They ex built up their own experience, and they bought another 25 machines, and then they bought another 100 machines, so almost 100 locations have replaced uh, cryotherapy with, uh, with the loop electrosurgical excision procedure. You know, Jose also dealt this morning, HPV testing is probably the most accurate, and if it is possible, that, that is something that we would like to introduce. An Indian randomized trial showed even a single round of HPV screening between 30 and 59 years can reduce cervical cancer incidence by incidence and mortality by 50%. And, um, a, and, and then again, the, 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 the screening intervals can be substantially increased. And with the increasing coverage of HPV vaccination in HPV vaccinated cohorts, the only screening test which will work is HPV testing. So that is the test of the future. But HPV testing is a test of infection. Okay. So you know, if you go to Guinea Conakry, you know, if you do a HPV testing, 40 to 45 percent of the women will be positive. So in a screen and treat setting, it will require substantial resources to treat all these women and you know, everybody who is HPV positive. So it will require some type of triaging. So in the triaging sense, even visual inspection with acetic acid is, uh, is a quite a, uh, useful um, test for triaging HPV positive women. Of course, if there is liquid-based cytology available, HPV genotyping available, they are all very useful. So at the moment, any HPV test a country will choose has to come with HPV genotyping. So the negotiation of the pricing and the test is in those terms. And the greatest advantage of HPV testing is its highest uh, negative predictive value. If a woman is HPV negative beyond the age of 30 years, the possibility of she developing a cervical cancer or a high-grade cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is extremely low. This is from one of the randomized trials in Barshi in Maharashtra state in India, um, you know, which shows the negative predictive value of um, um, VIA, the negative predictive value of cytology, and the negative predictive value of HPV testing. This is for incidence, and this is for mortality. And in fact, the negative predictive value of a negative HPV test is so high, so even we can leave with a single negative HPV test in, 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 a, in a routine healthcare setting, people can be left alone. This is a handheld thermal coagulator. Uh, this was partially developed uh, through a grant from the NCI to IARC. Uh, by a U.S. company, and this is, the prototypes have been tested. Now it is available in the market. And the thermal coagulation is something which, uh, which can uh, make treatment, ablative treatment of the cervical precancerous lesions much more feasible because the treatment time is so short. It's like 30 to 45 seconds it takes. Multiple applications is possible. And this is a battery-operated um, instrument. And there is a German instrument available, so there are the possibility of introducing thermal coagulation as a main workhorse for um, cervical cancer prevention is now more brighter. 
ultimately many of the studies which have been done you know by several colleagues including dr jose heronimo who is sitting here has led to formulation of very pragmatic policies which can be introduced in different healthcare settings if you see this this is the who algorithm of how you can organize a screening program in different um, settings so this is in the in the lowest uh, uh, healthcare system you know where there is no triaging available where one can resort to screen and treat by clinically excluding invasive cancer and then in places where triaging is available you know then you use either colposcopy or other triaging tests but whenever you introduce triaging tests there is a price we have to pay there are multiple visits with it associated uh loss in follow up so that is something which has to be taken into account actually whenever multiple visits are envisaged you have to also envisage multiple rounds of screening this is this is a, uh, this is a reality then finally you know cervical cancer you know when you do screening there are substantial number of women who will be diagnosed with cervical cancer it is unethical to leave people without treatment and in the case of hpv associated cancers cancers like vulva vagina and all those things have to be primarily managed with surgery and one of the major problems among the three treatment modalities there is quite a lot of noise made about uh, non availability of radiotherapy drugs and all those things people seldom talk about building capacity for surgery surgery is the single most important localized treatment modality for solid tumors and there is very little emphasis which has gone into building up surgical capacity in countries so for hpv associated cancers which are other than cerv cervix cancer and even in cervix cancer very early stage cancers like stage 1a and 1b there's a substantial role for radical surgery and that capacity needs to be built in you know you can you can you can list a number of management challenges here so i have just pointed out one challenge the second challenge is a substantial number of cervix cancers which will be detected in a screening program in the beginning years will be advanced cervical cancers the modal presentation will be stage 3 and stage 3 requires management with uh, radical radiotherapy or concurrent chemo radiotherapy whichever be it but look at the capacity of radiotherapy capacity in sub saharan africa this is as of today 28 african countries have no access to radiotherapy there are only 251 rt centers in entire africa while japan has 811 centers and two thirds of all the radiotherapy capacity in africa are located in egypt morocco and south africa so this is the situation um, uh, nigeria is the most populous country in africa it has only eight functioning radiotherapy services in the entire country and the second region which contributes uh, uh, quite a bit of um, 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 cervical cancer burden is south asia even in south asia if you look at this the radiotherapy capacity is limited so there is quite a lot to be done in countries in improving the capacity for management of cancer this is not only specific for cervix cancer you know the management the the investments one makes in imaging the investments one makes in diagnosis in histopathology in immunohistochemistry in uh, treatment modalities will contribute to a number of diseases not only cancer for others so this is this is, this is not to be forgotten and on a positive note you know if you compare with the pace with which uh, hpv vaccination despite all the negative publicity it has vaccine hesitancy it has generated the pace of hp vaccine introduction in the national immunization programs is much more uh, much more convincing much more promising than the pace at which the hepatitis b vaccine was introduced the plasma vaccine was uh, invented in 1982 the recombinant vaccine in 1989 the first developing country to implement uh, hepatitis b vaccination in health services was taiwan in the early 1990s and by 2000 only four countries have implemented hp hepatitis b vaccination as part of the extended immunization program this is after 
18 years. It became a Gavi eligible vaccine in 2003. And between 2003 and 2010, the number of countries implemented hepatitis B vaccination uh, you know, grew exponentially. Now almost 184 countries have hepatitis B vaccination. And the early introduction country, Taiwan, is already seeing a 75% decline in hepatocellular carcinoma in the vaccinated cohorts up to age 30 years. So in the next two to three decades, you will see the, the benefits of um, hepatitis B vaccination in preventing a very fatal cancer, liver cancer. So at the moment, there are about 89 countries which have implemented human papillomaviral vaccine. This is about 10 years, and it became a Gavi eligible vaccine about four years back. I think the pace at which it will go in, 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 uh, in, in health services is likely to be much more promising, especially with the availability of the Indian vaccine and Chinese vaccine in the market. These are young girls which we vaccinated in the, in the vaccination trial in India. And in fact, we were talking about a clinical, clinical trials this morning. This clinical trial was set up to address the efficacy of two doses versus three doses of vaccine. Because of what went ahead with the PATH uh, demonstration project, PATH program is not a clinical trial. It was a demonstration program to demonstrate in collaboration with the state governments of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat and with the Indian Council of Medical Research of the central government, how hep human papillomaviral vaccine can be integrated into routine health services. So this is a demonstration program as a preparatory role to learn how you can upscale. So this is, uh, uh, and, and seven people died, 17,000 uh, women, uh, girls at that time. So the suspension resulted in 5,000 girls receiving a single dose of vaccine. The suspension is not yet lifted, and that is how we arrived at a situation where, in a trial where we wanted to randomize 10,000, 20,000 girls into two, two arms, we ultimately resulted in a natural experiment of almost 4,000 girls with one dose, two dose, and three dose, and it became a natural experiment. So sometimes, you know, good things emerge out of things, you know, in India we have a fatalistic attitude. So something went wrong with the trial, but it is giving us good results. Thank you. With this, I, I would like to conclude this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. These were two great talks. And uh, um, any, any questions from the audience? I think we have uh, about five minutes. Um, yeah, excellent talks. I have a question about obesity. So how could this be assessed? It's such a variable that changes over time. I think everybody in this room has either gained sometimes 10 pounds or lost 10 pounds. And it's, I mean, or for me to be convinced that obesity is directly related to cancer development anywhere in the world, you'll have to you'll have to tell me weight in which decade, which year. What if I lose weight next year and then gain it again? You have to control for all the variables. So I'm not buying into the obesity causing cancer. Convince me. <laughs> if you look at the prospective studies that have been pooled, mostly done by the cardiology community, they have had sufficient numbers to look at some common cancers. And you're right, the main effect that you see from obesity, and what I showed there was adult obesity. It mostly are those that are measured as being obese in, um, in adulthood. It does not take into account the cohort of younger children, let's say in Mexico or in parts of the US that have been obese from early life and stay obese in adults. We don't have prospective information on those cohorts yet. But in that first cohort of adult obesity, the main excess is in vascular disease. And there is, however, for selected GI uh, cancers, 
colorectal cancer in particular, there is a reported excess. And that also fits with the observational epidemiology. Um, is it the biggest risk factor for, uh, for cancer in most populations? No, but it is a potential threat because of this evolution of childhood obesity. And I think the point that I wanted to make there is that um, you really need very high levels of obesity at the population level to get anything comparable to the risks that we have from being a typical smoker. So you know, in the US, if you do the maths, if you know, something like 30% of the population right. are modestly obese and it uh, knocks off three years off your life, that's a decade off US life expectancy. But if 20% of the population smoke and you lose um, about a decade of life, then um, that's uh, uh, two years off U.S. life expectancy. So smoking remains twice as important as obesity in the U.S. currently. Is there a duration? Just is there a duration of obesity? If I have to yeah. be obese for two years, four years. What if we, I'm we obese don't for have one enough, year and then I lose yeah. weight? No, but these are mostly studies that have kind of BMI at baseline, and they follow them up. Changes in obesity over time. People, you know, cycling through weight cycles, have not yet been studied reliably in in okay. uh, various studies. Thanks. A comment and a question. That, that first speaker was the real world data guy, and he posed the toughest question to you. Um, the question I really had, though, was your thoughts, Dr. Ja, about e-cigarettes. I mean, I, as a clinician, I have no problem trying to get a smoker to use an e-cigarette as a less carcinogenic option. But I think just recently the FDA banned the marketing of electronic cigarettes with names like uh, Lucky Charm and Cookies and Cream to kids. And I think a lot of the kids who use them use the device to smoke things other than nicotine. So your thoughts on that? Yes, well, I mean, you have to remember kids aren't human. So <laughs> they're, they're going to try all sorts of stuff. And in particular in the US, uh, but interestingly, not in the UK or to a lesser extent in Canada, there's been the confluence of quite innovative and mostly unregulated marketing, like you've mentioned. Unusual peer influences that are very weird at US high schools. US high schools are also very unique. You know, you, some kids become the cool icons. And uh, on top of it, Juul, um, designed a market, uh, designed a product, um, and you know, I've chatted with the Juul folks, they said, well, they really wanted to get adults to quit, so they wanted to design an attractive product, and they loaded it with nicotine. The hit you get from Juul is really quite good. And uh, the kids caught on to this. Now, there is evidence that high-dose nicotine is particularly addictive for the adolescent brain. So I do believe FDA has an appropriate role in saying, look, you got to knock the nicotine down. But as a strategy, a harm reduction strategy for getting adults to quit, it does have a role. And I fully agree with the idea that all of the trappings, you know, the cool ads and social media ads, all of that should be banned as it is for cigarettes or it should be for cigarettes. Hi, I have a question about the expansion of cervical cancer screening and treatment. You mentioned the example of Zambia and how the care was expanded there. And I was wondering if you knew kind of what led to that, if it was the pink ribbon, red ribbon coming in or um, other factors and how that could potentially be expanded in other countries. Because I think Zambia is one of the few examples where it's been expanded on that scale. Yeah. I think it is... Um it is partly the, the, the government commitment and the, and the presence of uh, donors who are catalytic rather than who try to imagine to be like service providers, you know, go there like a humanitarian assistance, you provide service and then withdraw. Rather than that, working with the government and trying to influence the government to make the investments rather than the investments coming directly from the donor agencies into, into, into the country. And as you said, the successful examples are like uh, Botswana, uh, Zambia. But on the other hand, uh, you, you know, this has not been the case in places like Kenya, Uganda, and other, other places, you know. So it is a, it is a mix of uh, these particular elements. 
which are which are responsible for that and for example i can i can tell zambia and then you also need some leaders some good leaders scientific leaders i think in zambia one of those leaders has been dr graspek parham um from alabama you know who has been there for several years you know catalyzing this type of development in the zambia can i just uh, ask one question as you may or may not be following we are facing now a crisis in the us of measles so it's like you were back to the beginning of the last century i guess because um, parents uh, have decided that you know vaccines cause all kinds of medical problems uh, based on zero science and disinformation what's the role of the government in enforcing vaccination in general <laughs> Yeah. Um, actually, in my home state, uh, recently, there was, um, uh, that is the state of Kerala, um, there, was, there was quite a bit of vaccine misinformation, and this state is traditionally very high coverage. And they said, finally, when they noticed it, they said anybody who spreads rumors in uh, social media are trying to prevent people from getting vaccinated and spreading misinformation will be prosecuted okay um, <laughs> i don't know what is the impact of this um, but on the other hand i think no country has in my knowledge has made vaccination mandatory but at the same time they are promoting vaccination probably i think given the the risks which are posed by uh vaccine hesitancy to the global public health i think one may have to consider making a certain number of vaccinations mandatory can i just add to that that any foundation has a bit of money and you want to hire a russian programmer to create <laughs> bots that would basically go and sanitize every website mm -hmm. for anti vaccine science i mean i would i would put into that kind of fund <laughs> Okay, last question. Um, back to cigarettes. <laughs> so we have a lot of evidence that if you're a smoker and you quit, it's great. Yes, what if you're sure. not a smoker and then you start smoking later in life? Uh, that seldom happens except uh, like in Indian men, uh, they start smoking later in life than in the West. That's what said, Indian men never grow up until they, live home, they leave home and get married. That's when they start to smoke. But in most populations, what's happened is uh, the age of smoking is now basically below age 20. Chinese smoking men has also made that transition. And once you reach 20 and you're not a smoker, the chances of taking up smoking are actually quite low. And also the risks of prolonged smoking are also lower. So it's, it's unusual to have late smoking. But the, the, the consequences are lower? Is, is that... Well, yeah, I mean, in medicine, we have this idea of pack years, which I think is a big mistake because, you know, if you take a 15-year-old a that started at age 15 and smoked a pack a day for 20 years, that's 20 pack years. You take a 25-year-old that smoked two packs a day uh, for, you know, 10 years, so that's also 20 pack years. The risk, at least for lung cancers and maybe for respiratory disease in the 15-year-old that started is way greater so there is this early duration expect, and you know, the pack years kind of confuses that, but uh, early start is the key of increased risks. Thank you. I think we'll need to stop at that point. A very quick question. It's very quick. It's regarding the cervical cancer and the vaccines. Of the vaccines available for use, the antigenicity for the various viral types varies tremendously. So how do you determine which of the vaccines to use and how do you evaluate communities where there may be viruses present where the ge uh, genomic profile doesn't match the vaccine? How do you manage that? You know, we have fairly consistent evidence across the world what uh, viral types are mainly responsible for HPV, uh, for cervix cancer. If you see the attributable fraction by HPV 16 and 18, it varies anywhere between 70 to 85 percent, but the variation is very limited. We know that. And in you know, choosing the vaccine, whoever provides the cheapest vaccine, choose them. 
<laughs> okay. Well, th uh, join me in thanking our speakers and moderators. Thank you very much. Outstanding discussion. So we.